Good morning, everyone. We'll begin today's COVID-19 press briefing with Mayor John Cooper, followed by Dr. Alex Jahangir, Chair of the Metro Board of Health and the Metro Coronavirus Task Force. This morning, we'd also like to welcome Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, Leslie Waller, Epidemiologist at the Metro Public Health Department, and Stephanie Titro, Co-Executive Director of TURC, the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. Director Chief William Swan of the Office of Emergency Management and Nashville Fire Department, and Dr. Michael Caldwell, Director of the Metro Public Health Department, are here with us to help answer your questions. We will now begin with Mayor John Cooper. Good morning, Nashville. I'd like to begin today by extending our wishes for a full recovery to those who are sick with the coronavirus and our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of those who have died, and it is a blessing in Nashville that that number is only 22. We must work together to further flatten the curve of the coronavirus in our community. Please remain safely at home whenever possible, and only leave your homes to run essential errands, and remember to wear face coverings when social distancing is difficult to maintain in public settings. Now, as I've mentioned, your efforts will largely determine the end of the safer at home order and the beginning of our city's safe economic restart. The Metro Coronavirus Task Force is tracking the public health benchmarks required to enter the first phase of the roadmap for reopening Nashville. And Dr. Alex Shehanger will report on these criteria momentarily. The phased data-driven framework for the roadmap for reopening Nashville contains metrics for carefully reopening our community in stages with built-in triggers to revert to previous phases to protect public health if necessary. As a reminder, the required criteria to begin phase one of our plan includes an acceptably stable or sustained decline in new COVID-19 cases over a 14-day period, adequate testing and PPE supplies for our region, low transmission rates, and the ability to conduct contact tracing investigations throughout Davidson County. As we track these criteria, we are also continuing to gather data to determine exactly how COVID-19 is affecting different communities within Davidson County. This morning, I want to welcome back Leslie Waller, epidemiologist with the Metro Public Health Department, who will present the updated Metro COVID-19 heat map and discuss how public health officials are responding to confirmed cases throughout our community, including robust contact tracing investigations and public education efforts. I also want to welcome Stephanie Titro, co-executive director of TURC, the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition, who is here to discuss their partnership with Metro Public Health in addressing the coronavirus among our diverse immigrant communities, particularly in Southeast Nashville. I'm grateful to Turk for its leadership in our city's coordinated COVID-19 response. And as always, I'm glad to welcome Dr. James Hildreth, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College, who has joined us again this morning to discuss the coronavirus and our community's response to the disease. Speaking as a community health care leader and infectious disease expert, Dr. Hildreth always brings authoritative and thoughtful insight to these briefings and to the major Metro's Economic Restart Task Force. I'm grateful that Dr. Hildreth has joined us this morning. Remember to visit covid19.nashville.com to view the roadmap for reopening Nashville. And remember, we want to hear from you. Your feedback may further inform the roadmap and help us better understand how our economic reopening can best serve all Nashvillians, including businesses and their employees, faith in communities, and working families across the city. But in order to get our economic restart up and running, we must stay the course and reduce the rate of coronavirus infections in our community. So let's work together towards this goal in order to save lives and get Nashvillians back to work. As always, I urge you to visit the Metro COVID-19 website and consider donating as you are able to the COVID-19 Response Fund by visiting covid19.nashville.gov. 
You can also visit the website to learn how to obtain direct financial food, mental health, and social service assistance. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Alex Jahanger, Chair of the Metro Coronavirus Task Force. Thank you, Mary Cooper, and good morning, Nashville. Here's the latest um, information on the coronavirus here in Davidson County. We now have 200, excuse me, 2,588 confirmed cases. That is an increase of 100 cases in the last 24 hours. We had an additional two deaths last night, an 81-year-old male and an 82-year-old female. Both had underlying health condition. That brings the total deaths of COVID fatalities in Nashville to 24. Our sympathies go out to their families. There are an additional 2,147 cases in our surrounding counties, bringing the total for our region to more than 4,700. Of the Davidson County cases, 1,313 are currently active cases, and 1,251 residents have recovered and have been cleared. Now, this is the third straight day of 100 or more new cases, and this has caused the rolling average to increase slightly. Furthermore, the transmission rate for our region now has become one meaning on average, a person with the virus is transmitting it to one other individual, and the outbreak is neither growing nor shrinking. Now, these metrics are concerning, but other, other metrics continue to be in the satisfactory range. Multiple metrics, not just a single one, are used to help in our decision on reopening. We will soon be unveiling a dashboard that will show the status of each of the metrics on the covid19.nashville.gov website. This will allow you to see the information the task force is monitoring to determine the timing of phase one of the reopen roadmap. You know, in medicine, when we face a challenging problem, we look at the data available to us and we get experts around the table to figure out the best way forward. This situation is no different. There's not one right answer and Mayor Cooper is evaluating the data and he has brought together leaders in public health, medicine and business, all experts to figure out the best path forward. This morning, we, will still not, we are still not where we need to be in order to set a reopen date. When we do, however, get to that point, we will announce a date to start phase one several days in advance so people can prepare. Now on Thursday, Nashville hospitals and dental clinics will begin to offer elective surgical and routine dental procedures to low risk patients. These healthcare facilities have protocols in place to keep patients and employees safe. For more information, please contact your local healthcare system or healthcare provider. Now, finally, please continue to help us fight the virus. Do your part to stay at home and only go out if absolutely necessary. Wear a face covering in public if you haven't been, then please start. This virus affects the elderly and those with medical co conditions the most. So if you are over 65 or have underlying health conditions, please don't go out. Remember, every day we stay the course is another day closer and we can get back to a new normal. I appreciate all the sacrifices you have made so far in fighting this virus. We're not there yet, so please continue to remain vigilant, and together we will beat this virus. I'd now like to introduce Dr. James Childers, President and CEO of Meharry Medical College. Good morning, Nashville. As counties and cities around the country prepared to open businesses, I'd like to offer a few key points that we should all keep in mind. First of all, the COVID-19 virus is going to be part of our lives for the foreseeable future until a vaccine is available. And while I truly believe the COVID-19 vaccine will break the record for producing a vaccine, and I hope that it's going to be a year, and that's possible but not very likely. And even if a vaccine is ready in a year, keep in mind that it takes time to establish immunity and sometimes we have to be given a series of shots over a period of weeks or months. And to achieve herd immunity, at least 60% of us will have to be immune to the virus. Second, some of you or some of us are counting on the warm, humid Nashville summer to control the virus. Please keep in mind that while the virus is being transmitted here in our winter, other parts of the world, it's actually summer and temperatures are hot and conditions are humid and the virus is doing just fine. So by all means, it seems to me that we should not count on the winter controlling the virus, uh, the summer controlling the virus for us. And I'd like to repeat an earlier point that was made. Viruses don't simply disappear. They do not behave that way. 
This virus is likely to still be in circulation in the coming winter, fall and winter. And what that means is we could be dealing with an outbreak of COVID-19 while dealing with an outbreak of influenza. That would mean two sets of patients would need ICUs and isolation rooms and could have the possibility of overwhelming our healthcare system and healthcare providers. We also need to be reminded that the actions we have taken collectively over the last several weeks have not put the virus in retreat. What we've done is to make sure our healthcare system is not overrun. The virus is still out there. And it's going to continue to spread until we have enough immunity as a population, as a human species, actually, to control the virus. The likelihood of outbreaks is high still. And without the means to test and trace and quarantine, we're going to be in trouble if outbreaks do occur. But this tried and true public health approach of testing, contact tracing, and quarantining is very effective, and we need to keep that uh, moving. Last thing is we need to take this virus seriously, and some people not, appear not to be doing so. Consider that in just four months, we've gone from a handful of cases to more than a million people being diagnosed with COVID-19 just in four months. And on top of that, 56,000 people have died, which is virtually the same number that died in the long and protracted war in Vietnam. And some people have compared this to flu. They shouldn't worry about it. It's just like the flu. If influenza killed 50,000 people in the United States in one month, believe me, the country would be going through what we're going through now. That would be a, a, a rate of 600,000 people in a single year, and clearly that would be cause for major concern. So <clears throat> some of you also still seem to believe that if you're young and healthy, you shouldn't worry about the virus. Well, hello. We now know that if you're young and healthy, you can die of strokes. <clears throat> the virus is causing unusual clotting in both the veins and arteries, something we've not seen before. So people in their 30s and 40s and 50s who are otherwise healthy are dying from strokes without any indication that they were actually sick. We also know that the virus can shut down the kidneys. So many people are requiring dialysis, and that's especially true in minority <coughs> communities. And as we've all heard, if you belong to certain categories with, with chronic conditions, you're more vulnerable to severe disease and dying. And that's true for minority communities. So they need to be considered vulnerable populations. So <coughs> we cannot achieve the goal of putting the virus in retreat if we give up too early on the things that we've been doing as a community. So my advice is that regardless whether or not business open or stay closed, we should take the personal responsibility of protecting ourselves from the virus. And by doing that, we'll protect, protect the whole community. So Nashville, I'm pleading with all of us to stay vigilant. The virus is still out there. We have the tools we need to, to fight it. And you know what they are. You might say it with me. We need to wash our hands frequently wear face coverings, protect our T-zone, sanitize high-touch surfaces. And if we keep doing those things, we will one day be able to get back to the social activities that we all enjoy. And I'll be able to take my boo to the movies once again. So <laughs> let's stick with it, Nashville. We got this virus in retreat. But we got to do what we need to do. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Leslie Waller, epidemiologist with the Public Health Department. Good morning, everyone. As you now know, uh, Nashville-Davidson County has had several days in a row with a high volume of cases reported each day. One of those reasons is uh, more testing. With more testing comes more cases, and uh, while we know that our positivity rate has fluctuated between 8.5 and 15 percent over the last couple of weeks, we do feel confident that these higher positivity rates are due to our ability to more rapidly test identified contacts, including entire facilities where there have been exposures and entire households where cases live. Testing of contacts has allowed us to find many mildly symptomatic or even asymptomatic cases who would otherwise act as unknowing vectors. Our cases identified over the last week are still geographically located and clustered 
in the southeastern part of the county. We know there are many diverse communities that reside here that can benefit from tailored uh, support and programming. We also know that there is no one size fits all approach to community education, especially during an emergency. This is one reason why our response team is constantly adapting our strategies based on what the data say. Last week, we were happy to share news of our partnership with the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition to help devise a strategy that can better help our neighbors through COVID. This week, we're happy to announce that Salome Health has also joined our team. Together, our multilateral partnership has honed in on the best practices and processes to ensure that our response team can best support these more heavily impacted communities through COVID. The health department's partnerships are the backbone to our public health responses. As such, our work can only become more complete and more successful with their collaboration. I'm happy now to introduce Stephanie Tietro, co-executive director at Turk. She and her organization have been incredibly supportive over the last few weeks as we've worked together to plan for COVID mitigation in some of our neighborhoods and communities. And I'm excited to have her share some of our progress. Thank you, Leslie, and good morning, everyone. I also want to thank the mayor for inviting me to share more about our work together to address the COVID crisis in immigrant refugee communities. As many of you are well aware, our city is incredibly diverse. Nashvillians hail from all over the world. Some arrived just a few months ago. Others have been here for many decades. This year, more than 130 languages were spoken in our school system. While much remains unknown about the coronavirus, one thing is very clear. Our personal health and well-being is interdependent with our neighbors, our coworkers, and societies at large. And that's why we must include everyone, including immigrants, in the solution to this public health crisis. Our organization and many incredible nonprofits across the city have been working to address the devastating impacts of the coronavirus on immigrant and refugee communities and how the impacts of this virus can be exacerbated for certain communities. A lack of English proficiency or health insurance may prevent some families from accessing testing or treatment. Other families may be too scared to seek care for fear of immigration enforcement. Undocumented Nashvillians may not have access to a lot of the economic relief programs. And so to pay for food or keep a roof over their heads, many are making the impossible choice of going to work in unsafe conditions and putting themselves and their families at risk of infection. And it is this work that brings us into partnership with the health department. We've been partnering with Leslie and her team to reduce the barriers to information and access to care that we've identified through our work in the community. Together, we developed a proposal to add community outreach workers to the health department's response team who would lead efforts specifically within immigrant and refugee communities. These outreach workers would conduct broad community education and provide uh, case management to individuals who'd contracted COVID. This program is based on successful models that the city has used to reduce barriers that immigrants face to accessing critical services, like the My City Academy program, which trains immigrant leaders in the work of Metro government, or the school system's parent ambassadors program that they've used to help newly arrived immigrant families navigate the school system with the help of established families. And the model of health outreach workers that we'll be launching is also a tested strategy. In fact, our partner Salome Health has developed an incredibly successful model of partnering their immigrant and refugee patients with community outreach workers. And so that's why we're so excited that Salome will be lending their capacity and their expertise to this initiative and overseeing the work of these community health workers who will focus specifically on COVID cases. As Salome and the health department partner with individuals and families who have contracted COVID. The outreach workers will partner with our team of organizers and community leaders to help connect these families with the resources and supports they need uh, to support their recovery, including addressing issues like food security and economic support, and to identify structural barriers to public health that may require a public policy solution. We're so honored to partner with the mayor's office, the public health department, and Salome to stand up this critical program. This important intervention will be connected to the broader efforts in the community to make sure that no matter where we're from or how we got here, that we all have access to testing and treatment and to the information and resources we need to care for our families. Because the only way we'll make it through this pandemic is together. 
Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We will now start the Q&A segment of today's briefing. As I announce your name, you may proceed by asking your question over the air. We'll start with Jeremy Finley at WSMV. Jeremy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for answering all of our questions. Um, I don't know if this is a question for your epidemiologist or for Dr. J Dr. Jahangir, but um, I had a question about the antibodies. I wanted to see if the city was considering uh, antibody tests for people, and also if that is still being consideration. Uh, there's a private company today that announced, a private lab that announced that it would be providing antibody tests for anyone across the country. And I wanted to get your viewpoint to see if you feel that the science is strong enough um, to, for people to go ahead and start seeking these antibody tests out or, um, you know, or possibly even purchasing themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Dr. Jungier. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. So in short, um, when antibody tests are, are more um, FDA approved and more accepted about what level of antibodies that, are, that the test determines is, is positive, allows you to have immune um, protective nature. I think antibody testing at some point makes a lot of sense. Um, at this point, the city doesn't have that plan um, to do that, but once there is a more approved antibody test that, that is universally accepted, I think that could be our next strategy regarding antibody tests. But at this moment, we don't have that. Um, Dr. Hildreth also would like to comment on this question, so I'll defer to him. Everyone needs to be aware that there are 100 companies that apparently have developed antibody tests, and some of them, quite honestly, are not very good because they cross-react with other human coronaviruses. And unless the antibody tests are highly specific, produce reproducible results, and we can validate their identifying COVID-19 anti antibodies versus antibodies as something else, they're a waste of time and a waste of resources. So we need to wait until we have an antibody that fits all of those criteria before we start doing widespread uh, antibody testing. And the other thing to keep in mind is antibodies do not mean that you're immune. That has to be proven experimentally, and we are not there yet. So it's a great idea for determining how prevalent the virus is in our communities, but at, for the time being, having antibodies does not necessarily mean that you're immune to COVID-19. So we all need to keep those things in mind. But the bottom line is antibody tests are springing up all over the place, but quite honestly, some of them are just not very good. We need to wait until we have one that fits the criteria that we need. Julia Palazzo at WKRN. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, I have my question for Ms. Waller or Dr. Jahanger. You could probably answer this, too. If I recall correctly, the hot spots in the southeast corridor of Davidson County, a few weeks ago you guys mentioned they're connected to employees who work at the same company. Is that the Tyson plant or a different company? Have you been able to determine that? And then also, Dr. Hildreth, I wanted to get your opinion about how you feel about the surrounding counties starting to reopen. I know you feel strongly about people staying at home right now. Thank you. We'll start with Leslie Waller. Yeah, so we do have uh, quite a number of cases who do reside in the southeastern portion of the county who are essential workers. And we are uh, also simultaneously investigating uh, numerous clusters in the city at this point. Um, that does include uh, organizations that we've discussed in the past, but also, um, you know, a variety of uh, warehouse distribution centers and food processing plants. So it's all things that keep our, you know, lives going as we're all in lockdown for COVID, but um, uh, it is impacting our essential workers quite heavily at this point. I have said many times, and I've tweeted about it and written about it, that what we really needed, starting back a few months ago, was a national strategy to combat COVID-19. Uh, but thankfully, we have leaders who made decisions based on science. And given that viruses do not respect borders, it is a problem when neighboring jurisdictions are not in sync 
because people can travel between those, uh, between those municipalities. My advice to everybody is you take responsibility for your personal protection. And that means that even if a business is open, you don't have to patronize it if you feel uncomfortable doing so. And I'm not suggesting that people not patronize businesses. Please don't. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you now know what things you need to do as an individual to protect yourself and your families. I'm suggesting you do that whether you cross county lines or not. Just keep that in mind that you can protect yourself by doing certain things. And if you go into a business and you don't feel comfortable that they've done the things that they need to do to keep you safe, then you have a decision to make. But clearly viruses are not respecting borders. We need to remember that in all the things that we do. Nikki Genowitz at Fox 17. Nikki? Yes, hi, good morning. Uh, this is a two-part question probably for Mayor Cooper. It's actually from uh, some Nashville restaurant owners that I spoke with uh, yesterday. Uh, Mayor, they were wondering if you would be willing to work with the governor to get the to-go uh, liquor regulations extended beyond Thursday. Um, as you know, a lot of those folks are still kind of doing those delivery go orders, and a lot of them are, are doing pretty well with the to-go um, beverages as well. Uh, they were hoping to have that extended, if possible, I guess. Um, my second question was they were also wondering, I understand that one of the um, – requirements to um, begin phase one is 14 days of declining cases. Um, also wondering when when did the clock start on that? Has it started yet? Um, kind of how many more days uh, are left if it has? Um, yep, those are my two questions. Mayor hey, Cooper. Um, the answer to your question uh, the first question of, is yes, of course. We want to do what we can to help all of our restaurant partners and servers. Um, the second question, I think, gets back to what is the data threshold. And as Dr. Jahangir has been um, clear about, is there multiple bits of data that go into this, including hospitalization rate, mortality rates, the net increase, so that's new cases minus recovered cases, uh, it's time to doubling is to make sure that, that it's an arithmetic line curve, not an exponential line. Um, and, and to be careful, as Dr. Hildreth was saying, in one month you've had more deaths than the Vietnam War. In one year you will have unabated more deaths than we had in World War II. So, um, being super careful um, is going to be important, but also let me follow on Dr. Hildreth's comments. People know what to do. We've spent a month teaching. Now people need to go do what they need to do because the virus is going to be with us in all phases of reopening, and public health is the responsibility of the public. And your conduct is going to be able to get us through into different phases of reopening and keep each other safe. Tosin Fakile at WSMV. Good morning. Um, I have two questions. The first is, um, I know Dr. Jahangir said tomorrow they're going to release um, some more, unveil some more of the metrics they're following. But I just want to get his thought. At this point, with three days of back-to-back -back increases in cases, new cases, how are you feeling about reopening in early May? Um, because May starts this weekend. So I was just trying to get his thought on that. My second question is, and this is from a, a viewer, if a restaurant is permitted to reopen in Nashville but decides it's not safe enough to return, Will the employees lose their unemployment benefits? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I committed to a date specifically of releasing the metrics, but I, I think we, we plan on doing it within the next day. So uh, I'll commit to you there. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, multi-metrics, not just one, multiple metrics, not just one, will determine our reopening. Um, and, and as I've used my analogy of medicine, you know, when there's a tough problem, 
Um, I look at the data. Um, I, I bring in experts, so I consult, you know, in, in medicine, other other specialties, and we make a decision. And sometimes it's a really tough decision. And and Mayor Cooper is using that exact um, method to do that with the reopening here. So we're looking at a lot of data, um, and and we'll keep adding, you know, maybe additional information as as needed. And then um, using experts will determine um, if opening happens. So. Um, you're right, May 1 is, I think, Friday, and, and as we've discussed, we're, we'll probably extend the order for some time. Um, I don't have an answer as to when that is, and as I mentioned, we'll try to give everyone a lead ways when that is, and, and we'll get to you very soon. Thank you. Chris Davis at News Channel 5. Chris? Good morning, everybody. Um, Dr. Jahager, you just mentioned that, you know, that you – uh, obviously don't have a date pinpointed for when reopening would take place. But for restaurant owners or other businesses that will be impacted by the different phases, you mentioned briefly in your remarks that there would be some notice, but can you give any clarification on how much notice some of these restaurants in phase one might get um, if we're ready to move forward for that? Dr. Jungier. Um We'd expect several days. I, I don't know exactly what that is, but it won't be like the next day. Uh, and then the last question, um, question I, I forgot to comment around unemployment. I, I don't know that information. And we'll, Chris, if you can make sure to follow up. So, but the, regarding this specific one, it would be a good enough notice that people can get their employees back, uh, possibly if need be any new training that needs to happen, obviously um, order supplies and, and so forth. So thank you. Nancy Amons at WSMV. Thank you. I have two questions for Stephanie. I hope I'm saying her last name right. Tetris. I'd like to hear her. Um, uh, thank you. I'd like to hear her um, thoughts again on the undocumented workers not getting public money, so they're working because they've got to feed their families. And for Dr. Hildreth, I'd like to hear his thoughts on. Yesterday, I noticed the rate, the percent of positive tests was 10.9 percent, and it fluctuates. I'd like to hear his thoughts on the fluctuating rates of positive test results. Thanks, Nancy. We'll start with Stephanie Tietro. Thank you for your question, Nancy. Um, so the whole purpose of the program that we're standing up with the Public Health Department is to address some of the unique barriers that immigrant families may have in accessing treatment and care for the COVID crisis. So my comment was in specific reference to some of the federal economic relief programs that, while they have been a lifeline for many people who have been out of work or have had reduced work uh, because of the economic crisis accompanying this public health crisis. Uh, for undocumented Nashvillians and for mixed status families, they are unfortunately have been ineligible for those relief programs. And so um, addressing, it's, it's our belief that addressing the economic crisis affecting immigrant families is critical alongside the public health measures. Uh, the question about the fluctuating rates of positive tests, part of it relates to what I would call statistical noise in, in the sense that the sample of people who get tested from day to day will vary in terms of how many of those folks are positive and those who are not. But on average, we've been at about 10 percent positive rate for quite some time. And the significance of that is that you might have expected if we gr greatly expanded our testing, we would have seen a difference in a percent of people testing positive. Most of the experts say that if your positive test rate is in the 20s, you're probably not testing enough people because we know that 20 percent of the population is probably not positive. So we have been enjoying a relatively flat percent positive rate, which means that things are actually pretty stable for us. And if anything, we can expect the numbers to start going down. In other words, I'm feeling good that our positive rate has stayed what it is over these period of weeks, because that means that maybe we have this thing under control, but we still need to be vigilant. But I think the 8 percent to 15 percent is just statistical variation depending on the people who come to be tested from day to day. Samantha Max at WPLN. Hi. Um, my first question is just a small one for Dr. Jahangir. It's just when will the dashboard become available? 
And then my second question is for the mayor. Can you talk about what your communication with the governor has been like in terms of reopening the economy? Has the governor been clear with you about the authority of the state versus local municipalities? And um, given the attorney general's opinion issued yesterday, does Metro actually have any authority to stop a restaurant or store from opening right now? Uh, the first question is about when uh, the dashboard will be made available. And then uh, the second question is for the mayor uh, in terms of conversations with the governor. Um, we will start with Dr. Jahangir and then we'll turn it over to Mayor Cooper. Dr. Jahangir. Hey, um, as I mentioned, um, I think the last question is um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll work to have the dashboard out within the next 24 hours, maybe later today, maybe tomorrow. I think just um, we'll, we'll have it out um, within the next 24 hours. Um, thank you. Um, the mayors of the largest counties and largest cities in Tennessee have been in relatively frequent communication with the governor, and the governor has been clear about the 89 and the 6. Um, that, is, um, that is a state policy about having the six counties, and that's in response, I believe, to the governor's view that each region is a little bit different and may have a slightly different response in getting back to work. We all want the same thing. Um, by a quirk of how Tennessee is organized, the governor does have direct control of health departments in the 89 counties. That's part of the state government. And in these other counties, there tends to be a little bit different. Metro, just let me remind viewers, with metropolitan government, the health department here is the Metro Public Health Department and is directly supervised by, um, by Metro. That's part of m the metropolitan path that the city went on starting back in 1962 though the unified public health department in Nashville predates metro government, interestingly. And that really goes back to the 1950s, where we have a little bit of a different path in terms of state law than other, than other either cities and counties do. Thank you. Nayeli Alamia with 96.7 FM. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Um, I have two questions. One of them is for Ms. Um, Ms. Waller. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you have mentioned that you, there is uh, an increase in the Antioch Southeast area. Um, with the latest information that we've received is that the vast majority are either white, Caucasian. However, there's an increase in the Southeast area. Are you seeing an increase in the contact tracing within the diverse community or immigrant community? And for Dr. Hildreth, is you mentioned that we are learning as we go. Did you address any additional symptoms for COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with Leslie Waller and then turn it over to Dr. Hildreth. Uh, yep, just to answer the second part of your question first, we are definitely um, performing contact tracing in the immigrant and refugee communities. And uh, we are having a lot of success there. Um, to address the first part of your question, um, you know, race data is complicated and it can be limiting. So uh, there are many types of people who might identify as white um, or African-American or black, um, and they might not fall into the um, you know, standard white or black communities that, that we might have. So um, there, are, there are just a lot of ways to identify there. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, <clears throat> you may have read or heard that the CDC has added six new symptoms to those that uh, indicate the possibility of COVID-19. And there's, uh, they're listed on the CDC website, but they include chills, shaking, shaking with chills, headache, and a couple of other things. But this reflects the fact that the receptor for this virus is all over the body. And in fact, when they do autopsies on people who've died of COVID-19, one of the pathologists was commented to say that he'd never seen anything quite like it, that the virus was replicating all throughout the body. And that's probably why it can cause blood clotting, shuts down the kidneys, all those things. Um, and let me just say, if you don't mind, this is why 
widespread testing is so important. If we had been doing widespread testing from the beginning and doing careful histories of individuals who then test positive, we would have known this many, many weeks ago. And who knows, maybe some lives could have been saved. Our final two questions are from Kara Hartnett at the Nashville Post and Brett Kelman at the Tennessean. We'll start with Kara Hartnett. Hi, thanks for taking questions today. Um, mine's for Wesley Waller. Um, I, I'm just wondering what role is contact tracing playing in these surges in daily case reporting or the positive rate variations? Um, are we nearing the containment phase? Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand how the evolution of contact tracing through the pandemic has contributed to the fluctuating data and what, what we'll be seeing in the future from that. Thank you, Kara. Ms. Waller. We are, uh, we can certainly attribute some of the cases that we're seeing to uh, our contact tracing efforts. Um, quite a lot of them actually. We've been working really hard in that area. Uh, we've been encouraging contacts to get tested and uh, we are definitely seeing um, some of our increases are, are due to that. Um, we also have ongoing clusters and the contact investigations within those clusters also lead to more testing of those close contacts. And Brett Kelman at the Tennessean. Hi, everybody. Uh, one more question for Ms. Waller. Uh, so when we spoke, uh, I think it was like six weeks ago, about uh, contact tracing sort of on the beginning of this uh, outbreak in Nashville, uh, it was you and Josh Love making a lot of calls every day to what was then a relatively small number of cases. What does it look like now? Like, how many people are we talking about? How many hours a day? How has contract tracing managed to keep up with this case rise? And what, um, I guess, functionally has changed in the process? Is it a matter of manpower or resources or tactics? Thanks, Brett. Uh, we'll turn it over to Leslie. Hi, Brett. Um, yeah, thank you for again for doing that story. We uh, we really appreciated that look into our lives as epidemiologists. Um, we have expanded our team. It is no longer just uh, Josh and uh, our small group of epidemiologists. We have a team of over 40 investigators right now. And uh, in total, the people who are helping us to daily active monitor our cases and contacts plus investigating our new cases is over 80. So we've certainly scaled up and we are scaling up even more. I'd like to thank Dr. Hildreth, Leslie Waller and Stephanie Tietro for being with us this morning. A recording of today's press briefing will be made available later this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's Metro COVID-19 press briefing. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.